I told you guys I would go to the reshot structure. I keep my promises. Here I am in beautiful, beautiful Mauritania. To begin the story, I think it's important that we go back a little ways. I think it's time we rewind to the beginning of this journey. Not only did the lost city of Atlantis actually exist, but its true location has been hiding in plain sight for thousands of years, completely unnoticed. The Wakart structure located in Mauritania, Africa, also commonly referred to as the Eye of the Sahara or the Eye of Africa, which most people have never even heard of, by the way is the most likely location for the lost city of Atlantis as it matches so many precise details of what Plato wrote. I'm currently driving uh, towards the border of Canada and the United States. Just left my lady behind for a couple months. Got over a flu. Still feel kind of sick. I'm not sure how that's going to play out with the malaria pills I got to take soon, but uh, we shall see, uh, assuming I get over the border just fine. Uh, here I am in North Dakota heading down to Las Vegas and once I get to Las Vegas I will be flying out uh, not too long after into uh, Germany then Spain and then we start our journey to Atlantis So it is April 24th, 2019, and I got to Las Vegas, uh, what, like 15 days ago or something like that. Um, and, you know, I had to leave my lady behind. I wasn't too happy about that. But, I, you know, I have to tell you, I've been like a, a whole bunch of different emotions going into this documentary, going into this trip to Mauritania, which is, it's kind of like up and down. My emotions are like, most of the time I'm confident and it's like, it's all going to be fine. And then part of the time it's like, um, I might die doing this. So last January, I was at a bar in Las Vegas, go figure, and I was with a friend, uh, a friend of mine named Anam Pashenta. And Anam Pashenta, um, I he was, you know, having a few drinks, I was having a few drinks with him, and it, we got to talking about ancient civilizations, and he knew about Quetzalcoatl and, you know, Veracocha and uh, these uh, gods and the connection with, like, Osiris and all these, and Utnapishtim and all that kind of stuff. And um, it, so basically I, I had to tell him about this thing that I saw from Bright Insight, Jimmy from Bright Insight on YouTube regarding the reshot structure and the notion that it could be Atlantis. So I told Anam Pashenta about this. Uh, he runs the Voluntarist Brotherhood. It's a, a bike group. Um, and he's like, well, why don't we go? We should go there. And I'm just thinking like, are, are you drunk? And then I'm like, I answered the question in my head. I'm like, he is drunk. And I, I'm kind of tipsy myself. Um, but yeah, let's talk about it. Let's do that. And then the next day I got up and I'm like, are you sure you want to go to Mauritania? Are you sure? Like, do you remember any of this conversation? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I'm totally down to do that. Let's do that. And so there it is. All right. So it's not the worst backpack I've ever seen. And by the way, I'm not wearing long sleeves there. Part of the culture in Mauritania is that you wear like baggy kind of things and don't show your elbows or your knees. So, um, but I mean, you got to cover up from the sun. What's worse, sweating from being underneath long sleeve clothes or burning to death from the sun? I don't know. Both sound not ideal. The eye of the Sahara. Staring into the heavens, this beautiful, magnificent sight that's almost never been visited by man stands apart from any other structure in the universe. Many say it's a collapsed volcano. Well, if so, it's a 25 mile wide collapsed volcano. Many say it's a meteor impact crater. If so, no other craters in the known universe look alike. But Atlantis? 
You may ask why on earth would one travel to the middle of the Sahara Desert in what is considered an Al Qaeda red zone to search for Atlantis in the desert. All great men take stupid risks for the sake of future information. Often they fail, often they gain nothing, often they change the world. In this film, we will bring ancient wisdom, ancient technology, ancient cataclysms, and ancient tales together to try and unravel an ancient story that today is scoffed at by skeptics despite the magnitude of facts coming forward to both scientifically prove it and fit it perfectly into a timeline of vast cataclysm. Here are the facts. Atlantis is translated as the island of Atlas. The Rishat structure, also known as Guelb Erishat, sits in the middle of Mauritania in the Sahara Desert, not too far from the Atlas Mountains near the Sea of Atlas, also known as the Atlantic Ocean, where Atlantis is said to have been. It is in the land of King Atlas of Mauritania, below the Strait of Gibraltar or the Pillars of Hercules. We see the city of Chaldees not that far north. Chaldees was the twin brother of Atlas who held on his shoulder the proverbial sphere. The reshot structure loosely fits the stadia measurements of 23.5 kilometers circular distance from one side of the circular structure to the other, which is theorized regarding Plato's measurement of Atlantis. But, of course, that's a controversial position to take, so we will not use that as evidence. This point was examined in a documentary on Atlantis several years ago. But where such stadia measurements came from is unclear. So we will provide this point simply as a suggestion to not put too much weight on in this documentary. But the reshot is indeed a series of concentric rings with what appears to be a center island. Many theorize that it was once underwater. We know this area of Mauritania, Africa was once lush with jungle and in a very short period of time became an arid desert. Mauritania today only has 0.2% farmable land leading to vast poverty and terrible conditions for the people placed sporadically throughout the country. Though you certainly won't find any residents of Mauritania including the wandering Berbers complaining. When approached they appear to be the happiest people in the world. The reshot structure appears to have mountains to the north with ancient rivers flowing down it as Plato recounted. It appears to exit to the south as Plato recounted. It's in a land where twins are common as Plato alluded to. It's also interesting that King Atlas was of a set of twins. There are seashells far inland at the reshot structure and what appear to be salt patches. Plato recounts that Atlantis had fresh water in the middle and salt water around the rings. There is indeed a fresh water well in the center island. There are water eroded plateaus that appear to indicate a long period of time underwater. From space it appears that the whole continent of Africa was blasted with water. It has been said that the sands of the Sahara originally came from the ocean. Well, that's an interesting timeline as the Sahara is theorized to have appeared almost out of nowhere between the Younger Dryas period and as recently as 6000 BC. While you may ask, Atlantis was on an island, how, how could the reshot be Atlantis? Well, its elevation makes it a perfect candidate among plateaus to have been an island and there is water erosion on the mountains leading up to the site. A large piece of land from Atar to the reshot would have been above water if water came to those water eroded plateaus. Plate tectonics pushing up the lands in the area could also account for this difference in elevation. Was the northwest coast of Africa once partially underwater? It's a theory worth considering. You may ask, get to the point, did you find Atlantis or not? 
It's more complicated than that. And there were many things that stood in our way during our journey to the site, as well as things that stood in our way once we arrived at the site. From government to unfortunate circumstances, we went to search for Atlantis because the reshot structure was the most likely candidate for Atlantis. We found evidence for and against the claim and we wish to show you in the most honest way. No confirmation bias, just truth as we saw it. I got this email from a guy named Graham and this Graham guy says, he, you know, he's from Texas and everything. He says he has ground penetrating radar. And look, I wasn't going to tell everyone when I was going on this trip because there are uh, concerns for safety by telling people about it. Uh, I only really told a few people like a guy named Justice Buma who ran Bab Sahara, Bed and Breakfast Sahara uh, in Atar, which he was helping me out as a travel agent and everything, uh, getting a driver and all that kind of stuff. But... I, I decided I had to tell this Graham guy what when we were going because, I mean, ground penetrating radar? Talk about the history we can make there. I'm just an amateur. Look, I just noticed that no one else was willing to go to Mauritania, to Udain, to Atar, to the Rishat structure or Guelb El Rishat as they call it. No one was going there and I knew I had to be that person, be the change you wish to see in the world, right? And I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And um, so I realized after I booked the tickets and promised everyone that I was going there that it isn't the safest place in the world and there are quite a few problems in the country. Uh, it, it wasn't exactly the kind of place I wanted to go. Uh, I was also told you can't touch women's hands in, in Mauritania, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, oh great, oh, well, what's a road trip gonna look like? Oh, we're going through Western Sahara, but you can't say the words Western Sahara in Western Sahara because it's a disputed country and Morocco thinks they own it. And if you talk about it and you say Western Sahara, uh, you could actually be arrested. So that was good to know. You have to tell me what you really think about, about me going to uh, Mauritania. Don't go. <laughs> Too late. All right, April 28th, 2019. Today is the day I'm fresh shaven for the last time in a little while anyway. And um, I'm going to begin my journey today over to, uh, I guess, Germany first. It's a bloody 12-hour flight. It's not going to be fun, but uh, it's part of the adventure. Um, we're going to be... Heading over to Frankfurt, Germany, where I'm going to be catching a plane uh, the next day, tomorrow, um, over to Seville, and that's in Spain, of course, and then we're going to drive to the Strait of Gibraltar, head on down the coast <laughs> through Morocco, Western Sahara, into Mauritania, where we will meet Graham, um, the guy with the ground-penetrating radar, who I'm excited to meet, finally, um, in Nouakchott, the capital of Mauritania, so that's going to be interesting. We're there to find the truth. This isn't about, you know, uh, this isn't about proving our bias or confirming our bias. This is about um, being able to prove something one way or another. If we find out it's an ancient volcano, good, we found out it was an ancient volcano. That's new information we didn't have before. And we could scratch Atlantis off the list and keep looking elsewhere or look for the concept anyway. And uh, if it's a crater, which there's not really any evidence of, but hey, if we find out that it's a crater, cool, we find that out too. Um, and if it has something to do with plate tectonics, we might find that out. If it's Atlantis, we will find out it's Atlantis. Nonetheless, this isn't about proving ourselves right. This is about proving one way or another. What is this place and what can we learn from it? Aaron texting and driving on the way to the airport as if there weren't enough threats to my life uh, on this trip. Me texting and driving is the least of your worries. Yeah. So uh, what do you think about uh, this whole adventure of mine? 
Um, well, I hope you come back alive because I actually, uh, I mean, you do bring value into my life. A little bit, I hope. Yeah. I try to. So, <laughs> I hope you come back alive. But if not, then um, I might move into your house. Okay. Well, um, the first part of the adventure is going to the airport, my favorite part. Well, finally leaving Las Vegas, and I am never going to get used to this in Las Vegas. It's so ridiculous. There are slot machines everywhere. Pharmacies, gas stations, you name it. And of course at the airport, because why not lose money at the last moment before you leave? This is a face I make when I'm wondering what the hell I'm doing in Frankfurt. Well, it is 5.15 a.m. I've been up for an hour. I slept about three hours, so there's three hours out of uh, two days. Anyway, um, Germany was kind of strange, and another day, another country. Off to Spain today, and um, I did get a not a bad hotel room, honestly. Uh, here in Frankfurt, but uh, I'm I think I look like I'm dying. I feel like I'm dying So I must be living So I'm just gonna say it everywhere I go here in Germany They either sell sausages or bread and basically only sausages or bread. I don't know how everyone here is in like 5,000 pounds Okay, I am at the airport. Uh, we're going to find out what's next right away because um, I'm gonna be meeting with Anum in Sevilla and uh, of course everyone is getting all ready for their awesome vacation to Sevilla and I'm on the other hand meeting up with someone so I can go to Mauritania but uh, you know what whatever we'll have a vacation uh, later on um, but yeah we're gonna meet up with uh, Anum and it's gonna be interesting because um, Anum and uh, Micah who are in uh, Sevilla have been partying kind of hard lately and we will see how they do in going from that climate to a country I believe that banned alcohol and um, walking in the Sahara Desert we'll see I don't know Adam's in better shape than me and he's like twice my age so we'll find out and uh, anyway I'm gonna get on my flight right away here and uh, we're gonna it'll be the moment we've all been waiting for meeting up in Sevilla to start our journey looking forward to it Okay, I have touched down in Seville and look who's here. You guys ready for an adventure? Yeah, oh, yeah. Africa. <laughs> All right, today is the day that we head down to Africa. Um, I think uh, we'll be heading over to Tangier first, so that'll be interesting. All new places, new country every day, and it's beautiful. So we are at the bus station in, what's this place called? Um, Nutshot. <laughs> no. Oh no, we're headed to Nutshot. Nuakshot, yes, in Mauritania. It would be helpful if we knew how to pronounce it. Um, but anyway, the point is we're at the bus station here in Seville and we are heading to Tarifa, I'm, I'm thinking. That's right. That's it. And then we are crossing the strait, so. We're gonna swim for it. Yeah, <laughs> wish, wish, us, wish us luck.
We stopped in some kind of small town. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but this is what I'm gonna miss in Mauritania. Food. I'm gonna miss food very much. And a lot of things like air conditioning and water and life and all that stuff. But it's part of the adventure. So we made it, um, we had to kind of run, but then it turned out that even though it said it was at a certain time, it looks like we are well ahead of time. Lots of people waiting. Uh, we are now heading to Tangier. absolutely zero immigration so this is uh, new to me it's been a while since I've been in the United States a whole few days felt a little bit more free for a little while anyway yeah definitely yeah I'm from the prairies I can't really handle these boats rocking back and forth so wish me luck on that uh, anyway let's see how this goes some rough seas There is a good chance that we will die, that we will not make this journey. But it's because when the seas are these rough, uh, they lose a lot. They, they lose, they lose the boats all the time. I think we have arrived. All yeah. right, you're, you're ready to step foot in Africa for the first time. I am. Yeah. We're alive still. We didn't have to swim after all. How did we do? Hey, Adam. How was it? It was great. I used the African toilet. First time? Yeah. <laughs> I got it. <AIDS. laughs> Okay, so we just got out of the cab and we are at the train station as you can see here and we are going to try and catch a train uh, over to Rabat. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, doesn't look like much of a lineup and but whatever we're in Africa and our journey begins. We are going to rock the Casbah. <laughs> At long last, we got our tickets. It was the card worked, and we are off to Casablanca. I feel like half of this trip is exchanging currency over and over and over again. I am now walking through the streets of Tangier in Morocco, trying to find an ATM so I can actually use money. And it's like I'm telling you, like a billion different currencies I've been through in the last while and I get I think I have to deal with Aguyas next in Mauritania it's just man but it's beautiful though absolutely beautiful in this city ancient you could tell and there's a Hilton here if anyone's ever wanting to uh, stay I'm gonna check in the mall for this stuff now yeah it's one of those days um, the the mall was pretty nice um, I'm gonna have to get used to everyone looking at me funny though I kind of expect it though, I mean really. I'm out of place. Their train station so far looks way nicer than ours. Anywhere in the so-called first world in the west. Much nicer train station, very impressed. <laughs> It is. It is. Talk about leaves. Leaves. I eat leaves. Fucking leaves. Vegetarian. I mean, it doesn't work. So we just, um, 
first class. Was it too hard? I guess this is the way to do it. Huh? The donkey. <laughs> Well said. <laughs> Few words, but never truer. Right. Well, we've arrived in Casablanca. I'm not sure what our next move is. We are going to. Move? We are going to attempt to um, find out where we go next. I don't know how this is all going to work. Another train, another bus. I don't know. This is going to be interesting. Okay, so we are desperately trying to get to Nawakshot. Um, it's incredibly difficult. Um, you know, online there's 50 different examples of how to get there, but none of them work for us. Well, we got first class. It's not so bad. We got some leg room and, you know. It smells like dirty feet in here. Yeah, it smells terrible. And we got uh, Casablanca. But oh, uh, we're Oops, heading. <laughs> We're heading to um, Marrakesh, and then from Marrakesh to Agadir, and then Agadir to Dakla, and then Dakla to Nawadibu, and Nawadibu to Nawakshot. Dude, it's going to be so crazy trying to catch each bus and train going on and on and on. Like, it's going to take so long to get there. It's further than it looks. Like, on the map, it does not look that far. And then it's like days and days and days of traveling at high speed on a high speed rail. You just never get there. It's crazy. But eventually we'll get there. Hoping. From there we frantically searched for a bus from Marrakesh to Agadir. After nearly missing the bus, we made it and off we went once again to Agadir. Once in Agadir, we realized we were starting to get into the thick of it. We got off at a bus station filled with flies. No one was working there. It was dark. Everyone was staring at us. We realized there were no buses and went to find a hotel. The cab driver immediately saw opportunity and attempted to extort us. He told us there were no hotels under $130 a night. We saw through that pretty easily. Anam knocked on doors in the dark streets of Agadir, eventually finding a hotel with three beds for $36 a night. After being up forever driving around Morocco today, um and getting in a cab in Agadir looking for a hotel room because the Dokla bus is going to take forever to get to. Or we have to wait a whole long time. Um, cab driver tried to rip us off. We showed him that there's cheap hotel rooms, and then we got this hotel room here for a pretty decent price. Um, whole issue is getting to Dokla tomorrow, and it's like a 20-hour drive, and then on top of that, we got to deal with getting 10 hours there to Nawakshot, and then another like four or five hours to Atar, so it's still a long, long journey. I guess we could say we're just under halfway through, but we'll get there. It's just, uh, it's getting a little bit sketchier every time we go a little bit more south. Things get a little bit more weird. Lots of nice people, but it's, uh, feeling a little out of place. We've been lied to. We've been misled. We've forgotten our own past. We've been told that humanity existed for hundreds of thousands of years without developing until suddenly in the year 3000 BC, primitive people threw down their spears to build the most magnificent structures humanity has ever been capable of. This is an old guard belief system that has been thoroughly debunked. Still, many in the archaeological community remain stubborn and cling to ideas brought to the mainstream attention, much of this information being completely assumed and not proven hundreds of years ago. If you repeat something enough times, people will begin to believe it. Atlantis is a place of great legend. The question people have been asking for literally thousands of years is, and I quote, was it a real place? A fictional example of a society that rises and falls? Or was it a bit of both, end quote? 
Like most legends, they're inspired by bits of truth. For millennia, ancient civilizations from all over the world without apparent connection to each other have come up with almost the same storylines in their legends and religious genesis stories. For example, the epics of Gilgamesh and the story of Utnapishtim and the Great Flood in ancient Babylon, found on tablets considered to have been written around 2100 BC, though some believe as far back as 3000 BC, which is a timeline we will get back to later. The given date for Gilgamesh is of course assumed, but nonetheless it is considered to be one of the first examples of literature in history. There are parts of the storyline that seem unlikely, but nonetheless the epics of Gilgamesh go as so. As it says, I will proclaim to the world the deeds of Gilgamesh. This was the man to whom all things were known. This was the king who knew the countries of the world. He was wise, he saw mysteries and knew secret things. He brought us a tale of the days before the flood. He went on a long journey, was weary, worn out with labor. Returning, he rested. He engraved on stone the whole story. Gilgamesh told the story recited to him by Utnapishtim, a king who had once ruled thousands of years earlier. The king survived the great flood which brought to him the reward of immortality. This reward was due to the king preserving the seeds of humanity in the face of extinction. There were four gods who lived on earth. Enlil, the enforcer of divine decisions, Anu, the lord of the firmament, Ishtar, goddess of war and sexual love, and Ea, lord of the waters, man's natural friend and protector. The world multiplied and advanced and became loud. Enlil found the world so loud he could not sleep, so the gods agreed to exterminate mankind. Ea, feeling pity, for Utnapishtim instructed him to build a boat in which he and his family could survive. As the tablets read, tear down your house and build a boat, abandon possessions and look for life, despise worldly goods and save your soul. Tear down your house, I say, and build a boat with her dimensions in proportion, her width and length in harmony. Put aboard the seeds of all living things into the boat. Udnapishtim did as he was told and said the following. I put on board all my kith and kin. Put on board cattle, wild beasts from open country, all kinds of craftsmen. The time was fulfilled. When the first light of dawn appeared, a black cloud came up from the base of the sky. It thundered within where Adad, lord of the storm, was rising. A stupor of despair went up to the heaven when the god of the storm turned daylight to darkness. When he smashed the land like a cup. On the first day, the tempest blew swiftly and brought the flood. No man could see his fellow, nor could the people be distinguished from the sky. Even the gods were afraid of the flood. They withdrew. They went up to the heaven of Anu and crouched in the outskirts. The gods cowered like curs, while Ishtau cried, shrieking aloud, have I given birth unto these mine own people, only to glut with their bodies the sea as though they were fish? Utnapishtim continued saying, for six days and nights the wind blew, torrent and tempest and flood overwhelmed the world, tempest and flood raged together like warring hosts. When the seventh day dawned, the storm from the south subsided, the sea grew calm, the flood was stilled. I looked at the face of the world and there was silence. The surface of the sea straighted as flat as a rooftop. All mankind returned to clay. I opened a hatch and light fell on my face. Then I bowed low, I lay down and I wept. The tears streamed down my face, for on every side was a waste of water. Fourteen leagues distant there appeared a mountain, and there the boat grounded. On the mountain of Nasir, the boat held fast. 
She held fast and did not bulge. When the seventh day dawned, I loosed a dove and let her go. She flew away, but finding no resting place, she returned. Then I loosed a swallow, and she flew away, but finding no resting place, she returned. I loosed a raven, she saw that the waters had retreated. She ate, she flew around, she cawed, and she did not come back. Now I'm sure this story immediately reminds you of Noah's Ark and the Genesis flood. God is angered, a flood washes over the world, Noah is warned and builds an ark, ends up on top of a mountain, sends out birds, we've heard it before. He must rebuild humanity and life on earth from there on. The fact is, there are over 500 examples throughout the ancient world of a great flood story, according to studies done on the matter of 86 stories analyzed, it has been established that 62 of them had to be completely independent of the Mesopotamian and Hebrew accounts. Graham Hancock, the legendary author of Fingerprints of the Gods, Magicians of the Gods, and America Before, among countless other incredible pieces of groundbreaking literature, looks at this phenomenon as perhaps somewhat of a helping hand. That a great civilization was wiped out by a great cataclysm and a few survived among the hunter-gatherers. The most likely independent people to survive such an incredible cataclysm. There they spread their knowledge of the technology they harness to future generations, to the people of Gobekli Tepe and to the Egyptians, and were viewed as gods from there on. These intelligent, advanced people had once been seasteaders. Their original storyline was the same. But like a game of telephone throughout history, their stories differed enough to benefit the cultures of each individual civilization. We've already released a documentary on the ancient cataclysm according to the ancients and the alarming similarities between the stories of the Incas, Aztecs, Mayans, Olmecs, Egyptians, Indians, Babylonians, Chinese, Sumerians, Greeks, and countless other ancient civilizations. We won't go over all of the examples as it took an hour-long video to just partially break it down in our past documentary, but for reference, the viewer may watch our past breakdowns of this phenomenon. Nonetheless, religions and cultures around the world swear by this handed down knowledge. Knowledge we will break down further in this film. Yet Atlantis is generally laughed at as nonsense and even to some as conning. Plato was a great historian. The notion of Plato making up the story of his ancestor Solon meeting with an Egyptian elder in Sais who recounted this lost land of greed and misfortune is more unlikely than it is likely. Many claim Plato made up Atlantis and that his wise ancestor Solon was just used in his storyline. Meanwhile, Herodotus drew a map showing what appeared to be Atlantis in the area of Mauritania a few years after Plato was born. Now, to be fair, it could be a strange translation of Atlas itself, and again, King Atlas reigned in Mauritania, but it's interesting nonetheless, considering the context of the theory we are exploring. Another point worth making about Atlantis is that it is technically Latin and was in a war with Athens. First, what we could be seeing is simply the Latin translation of the original name. Perhaps Atlantis is just a given name for a real place whose name perished from a great ancient technologically savvy civilization. Second, as far as we know, Athens certainly did not reign as a city in the time frame of Atlantis, which would have been situated around the Younger Dryas period. But civilizations always inflate their grandeur with exaggerations as if they are all that has ever been and all that will ever be. For example, on our journey through Morocco on a train as we traveled, we spoke to a man near Casablanca. 
and ended up talking about ancient poetry. He talked about how much he loved Mauritanian poetry and I noted how ancient Mauritania truly is as well as Libya. He had a strange reaction and insisted to us that Morocco has been there forever because his government told him so and that all other countries today stole the land from Morocco. That Morocco is the oldest and greatest country in the world. When I questioned this, he looked in the direction of a government official and made up a story hastily about how he had to go and do something. He looked scared. If this kind of illusion of grandeur exists today, imagine what it looked like in the highly complicated times of ancient Greece. Though with that said, it is true that an island has recently re-emerged from the water near Greece, showing extraordinary white marble ruins that predated the Greek Empire and seemed to create a route towards ancient Egypt. So there is, of course, a lot more to be explored as far as the true age of Greece and their culture. We woke up in Agadir, which was quite different from waking up in Seville. We were still in a minor state of culture shock and our bodies were falling apart from a day of constant travel and stress running around trying to find trains and buses. While the trains were now behind us, we had a 24 hour bus ride ahead of us. I couldn't get over the strange Asian cartoons on the wall of our hotel. Here a man randomly takes my bag out of my hand and tries to get a tip out of me. Not today. The last bit of food and drink. What, what do you got there? Uh, it's a small latte. Got a latte, all right. And here it is, uh, Cafe au Laut. <laughs> and we are still in Agadir and I asked for an orange and I got orange drink, but you get what you pay for. The 24 hour long bus ride we were about to get on had no bathrooms on the bus, few food breaks, and many mishaps. Are we able to get on? Yeah. There are people getting on, why are we not? Right? That one's the one to talk to. Oh, yeah. All right. I can't stand it. We're on the road. That's the, maybe the start of the bus. The beauty of the country was apparent, but the constant travel was killing us. On the road to Dakla, um, not what I was expecting from the Sahara Desert. It is raining. Lots, lots of water. <laughs> First impression of the Sahara Desert, cold, rainy, exactly as we expected. We might my island. An elderly man sat in front of us, a nomad. He had never seen a white man before. He stared at us. Adam shared snacks with him. It appeared as though the nomad had never been in a moving vehicle before either. He was constantly in a state of shock. I realized we weren't the only people on an adventure.
Uh, so we're in some town. Um, it's actually pretty nice. Good infrastructure and all that. Um, I think it's called Gelamim. Yeah, here's a map behind us. That helps. Guelmim, maybe where we are. Guelmim, that's it, yes. And we are not going to Asa or Zag. We are going to Tantan and Bujdor and Dakla. And uh, we're somewhere in between Asa and Djibouti. <laughs> you just can't get enough of the, of the Djibouti. <laughs> <laughs> just never ends. Mm, uh, seems like a nice person. I couldn't help but notice that the surrounding landscape appeared as though it was once a seabed. Not sure where we are. So these guys they insist that while I was sleeping, um, there was a checkpoint and then they went through and questioned us. Um, he insists on not believing us. 100%. Yeah, 100%. that happened. We told them we are not Canadians and we are not journalists and they let us go. <laughs> uh, so only, I wake up to... One of those is true. <laughs> so I wake up to basically everything and apparently a checkpoint guy came through and talked to them right beside me and I didn't notice. It's a likely story. I don't know. I'd have to see it to believe it. Your sleep uh, <laughs> trick worked on him. I can't yeah. believe it. I, good, good one, Josh. Yeah, he knows all about it. He was like, "Yeah, I was just waiting." Next for time you they come in, I'm gonna pretend like I'm asleep too. <laughs> oh, anyway, we're at the ocean. I'm tired. Very, very, very tired. They weren't wrong. Checkpoints came one after another, making us later and later. It seemed like it wouldn't end. They'd take our passports, disappear into the darkness, and demand answers from us on their return. Was I a journalist? No, I was a fiction writer. That's what I told them. It was a stupid excuse I had made up when they woke me up from my sleep. Too groggy to think of anything else, I now had to stick with fiction writer. They keep taking my passport every like, hour or so. You thought we were lying. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were lying. It's true though, like a million checkpoints. They say it's for our safety. I feel pretty safe. Well, when they're not around anyway. <laughs> Here, a man is removed from the bus and arrested for trying to climb on the seats. The man was talking to himself and going crazy. It put us behind several hours, causing us to miss the next bus in Dakla, Western Sahara, slash Morocco.
I'm desperately trying to hide my videotaping from the guards. I knew I needed footage of the checkpoints, but I was seriously concerned about the ramifications. If I got arrested, that trip was ending fast. Okay, we are in Dakla um, and we need to get to um, Nouakchott in Mauritania to meet up with Graham with the ground penetrating radar. Um, we are a little late because, well, we kept getting stopped for check, at check stops for our passports over and over again and there was a crazy guy on our bus who ended up getting arrested. So that put us really behind. But um, we are going to try our best, like usual, to wing it and hope that we catch a bus somehow to uh, Nouakchott. Apparently there's one in like three hours somewhere and we have to get paperwork done. So we'll see what happens again, as always. Unable to find a taxi, we hopped on the back of a cart attached to a motorcycle. That's one way to get around anyways. told we had to go to the police station to get papers to cross the border. Okay, so after the cab ride, um, what ended up happening was, well, if you call that a cab ride anyway, we uh, got to the police station. They said we can't fill out paperwork there, so we have to go somewhere else. And we just decided, well, we need to get to Nouakchott. So uh, we'll figure out all the paperwork at the border. Um, we got um, somewhere in Dakla here, and we have uh, got a guy, a really accommodative. I mean, people are incredibly kind here and have been helping us out with everything. Obviously, uh, never trust anyone <laughs> when you're in another place, but um, these people are, have been very kind to us and they offered us a deal to drive us right to Nouakchott um, from, from Dakla, which is like a 10 hour drive for equivalent of about $50 each. So that's not bad at all. And I'm actually seeing a lot of um, Westerners out here walking around, though we do get some strange looks just because we're out of place, obviously. But um, this is a really beautiful city and it's actually cooler than a lot of places in the US. I was expecting it to be a lot hotter here, but um, I'm, I'm really enjoying this place. I just had a meal at a place called Hotel Al Aram. And uh, we are going to be on our way right away once Anam finds a SIM card for his phone for security reasons, just so he can access um, the internet while we're on the road in Morocco anyway. Well, we'll, uh, we'll jump in the vehicle and get going right away and uh, wish us luck from there. We hitched a ride with someone at a cafe and off we went. Though the guy was determined to stop every two minutes to try and pack more items into the back of his van, which was already falling apart. Alright, so he's not in the car. He kind of just walked away. I'm not the most trusting of these chaps, so hope for the best, I guess. We sent out alerts and stuff just in case. Um, just, I, I don't know, feels more accommodative than a bus ride. Got more power to stop and pull over and grab food if we need to. And the border closes to Mauritania at 6 p.m. and it's like almost 12 p.m. So uh, hopefully we don't have any issues getting over and hopefully we're not robbed. Yeah, I'm trying to get out. And the phone uh, phone.
We had six hours to go, but the driver who didn't speak a word of English was nicer than us. He couldn't help but stop and help everyone he saw. He would grab everyone's hands and pray to them and their family. He even stopped and tried to fix the engine of a car stranded on the side of the highway. When that didn't work, he attached a rope to the car and tried to pull it down the highway. At this point, we were all looking at each other, wondering if we were going to make it across the border by 6 p.m. There was no air conditioning and I was getting air blasted with hot, sandy air. He wouldn't let me put the window up for hours. After straightening the tires of the decrepit van, pulling someone, this happened. As the belt of the van screeched, we were back on the road with an even balder tire. But we simply weren't going to make it. Our driver decided since he had made us late to pitch in on a border town hostel while he slept in his van. We had to wait another day to get to Mauritania. We were so close. The hostel was likely the worst place I'd ever slept. And it continues. Um, Tire blue, <laughs> we end up at the border late and they won't let us through and we are in whatever this is. Um, flies everywhere. 
it's kind of like 6 p.m. and we can't really do anything till tomorrow, so. Here's my life, uh, Brian, in your 20s, built in your 30s, chill in your 40s. My life. All right, so this pillow is disgusting and it has Hello Kitty on it and um, there are bugs all over the wall and there's sewage behind us but um, we are on our way to Mauritania I think we made it like 10 kilometers from Mauritania so close but apparently they close the border at 6 p.m. and people can't walk from point A to point B sounds familiar um, we got some good old black mold on the ceiling Yeah. It's pretty nice. It feels great on my already damaged lungs. And a hole in the floor for a toilet, so... Anyway, I think this will only get better. I, I gotta think that. Every time I think it can't get any worse, it gets worse. So, I mean, eventually you have to hit that bottom point and bounce up, so... Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think we're going in the right direction. Ah... <sighs> Out of fear of realizing the reality of the cockroach-infested, black mold-plagued room I was staying in, I slept. And I slept for 12 hours. Waking up periodically to brush cockroaches off my face. Yes, really. According to Plato, as I noted, the story of Atlantis allegedly comes from ancient Egypt. Now, like the Tower of Babel, people became so advanced that they became gods, and there was no more need for the true gods. So the gods struck them down. The same story tends to reappear in Egypt with Thoth, a wise Egyptian god striking mankind with a great flood. A funerary text discovered in the tomb of Pharaoh Seti I talks about the destruction of sinful humanity by a great deluge. As it explains, the moon god Thoth said the following, and I quote, They have fought fights, they have upheld strifes, they have done evil, they have created hostilities. They have made slaughter, they have caused trouble and oppression. Therefore, I am going to blot out everything which I have made. This earth shall enter into the watery abyss by means of a raging flood and will become even as it was in primeval times. As it appears, the moon god Thoth is looking down on the people of earth and their sins. Another flood story revolves around Adam. The Egyptians worshipped god Osiris. Osiris was one of the nine original gods who appeared in Egypt during what they called the first time, also known as Zeptepe. As the origin story goes, the land had risen from endless water. Ra, the sun god, materialized in his self-created form as Adam. Ra birthed Shu and Tefnut. Shu and Tefnut birthed Geb, the god of the earth, and Nut, the goddess of the sky. These two also mate and create Osiris and Isis, Set and Nephthys. They all became the nine gods of Heliopolis, the most ancient and sacred city in Egypt. Ra, Shu, Geb, and Osiris were said to have ruled in Egypt as kings, followed by Horus. And then for 3,226 years, the Ebus-headed wisdom god, Thoth. Interestingly, Adam said he would destroy all he made and return the earth to the primordial waters, which was its original state due to the rebellious nature of the people. Adam will remain in the form of a serpent, with Osiris as the story goes. Well, interestingly, Osiris journeyed throughout the world to pass on wisdom he had known. Architecture, agriculture, civility, pictured alongside serpents quite often, it's interesting to note that the Aztecs, Mayans, and Incas, as well as the Olmecs on the other side of the world, spoke 
of Quetzalcoatl and Veracocha, both gods who were white that came from the east over the sea to them and taught them all the things that Osiris was said to have taught people. He then returned to the east after all was done. Of note is that both Viracocha and Quetzalcoatl are associated with serpents. In many cases, like a serpent god. They both had beards as well. These Central and South American cultures forever worshipped this entity or entities. To the point where the Spanish invaded and the Aztecs, Mayans, and Incas laid down their weapons, thinking that these light-skinned people were the return of their god. They were then slaughtered and much of their history was destroyed as satanic. These cultures also had a very similar flood story where their boat landed on top of a mountain in an ancient epoch. One can reference the Popol Vuh legends which we documented in our film Ancient Cataclysm according to the ancients. We now know today that these great cataclysms did indeed happen. With the discovery of the Hiawatha Crater in Greenland and core samples, as well as what some call the Younger Dryas Boundary, which shows the Earth withstood an incredible cataclysm for thousands of years during the hellish timeline of Atlantis, we now have no doubt that such floods were a reality. In fact, 75% of all mammals in North America were wiped out almost instantaneously. Giant sloths, camels, North American lions, etc. There were mammoths in this period who were flash frozen with food still in their mouth and undigested food in their stomachs. So isn't it interesting that this all occurred around the same period surrounding the Younger Dryas period that Atlantis is set to have been destroyed in a day and night of misfortune. The same time frame as Noah's Ark and the epics of Gilgamesh. The same time frame as that of the Egyptian so-called first time. The Indian story of Manu and Vishnu in the form of a fish saving him from a great cataclysm in a boat. At the same time as water in Lake Titicaca would have reached the once spoken of port town of Pumapunku now many, many miles from the lake, which holds some of the most fascinating relics of the ancient world. Why were large functional boats recently found built as homages to Osiris and Ra if they were desert dwellers? So many questions could be asked of this, the world's greatest coincidence. Or perhaps the world's greatest hidden secret? I'll show you the crib. So here as you can see we got some custom made mold up on the ceiling. We got a bed with an old mattress. That's the bedroom. Yo, show the bedroom. Yo, show yo, the yo. living room area. Uh, yo, check us out. That's the f That's the living room. This is where I slept. This is uh this is where Josh slept over here. This bed's custom beds, man. Custom show this, yo, show the custom kitchen. made for discomfort. Show the kitchen area. Yo. Check this out, folks. <laughs> This is where we can eat, man. We got all this room around here to put like food here. Oh, dude, check that out. One guy, one guy. Yeah, yeah, dude. But then check this out. Check this out, dude. This is legit. Bathroom area, boom, sink. Oh, there's a dark hole. There's no lights up in this B. Dude, let me let me get some flash on this. Oh, fuck yeah. Custom custom ribbing for your feet. This is our quality shower right here. Boom, dude, we got one up top. Check out that pressure, bro. Check out that pressure. And we got one down below for your feet. Don't forget our sick Hello Kitty pillowcases. Oh, yeah. yeah. With yeah. roaches. <laughs> With roaches. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Some kind of, oh, a jumping. Oh, dude, f dude, I don't even know these bugs. <laughs> we got some black mold on the ceiling. Really nice. Yeah, f yeah, dude. I almost got it. <laughs> Check out our quality mirror. Oh, Hell yeah. <sighs> Alright, so we woke up to um, some really nice chanting and uh, morning prayer here at by the border of Mauritania and Morocco. Actually slept really well. Um, I won't show you right, right now, but uh, there's 
an interesting bathroom where you got a little tap and you know you wash yourself off and you know the usual hole in the floor kind of toilet but I don't know it seems worse than it ended up being um, Anna what do you think of this whole experience so far a man of uh, many words has little <laughs> words um, it's been a pretty incredible experience. Something I'm not going to be forgetting anytime soon, that's for sure. Um, just got to get enough electricity and internet after yesterday's mishap in the desert where um, <laughs> we ended up having a flat tire. A man is going to come and pick us up, um, determined to get us to Nouakchott at 8 a.m. And we go across the border and then we try to get to Nouakchott as fast as we can. It's about five and a half hours away. Um, that's where we'll be meeting Graham and we will go from there to Atar, but uh, we just gotta get through the border first and we'll get a ride out to Nouakchott. still pretty early as you can see. It's like 7 a.m. It's pretty cool in the morning. I got a dog over there, a bunch of them, a bunch of strays. Do not wish to inquire. Overall, it's both an interesting, cool place, friendly place kind of a sad place. That dog's loving you. <laughs> we spent hours trying to pass through the border one inspection after another. It was easier for me than it was for Adam and Micah who both had American passports. Our driver realized it was not possible for his van to make it all the way to Nouakchott, so he attempted to pay a stranger to drive us instead. So let's talk about what's happening here. So um, here's a van, as you can see, um, still decrepit and all. And uh, the guy has paid, I think, someone to bring us to Nouakchott. Um, he seems like a nice guy. <laughs> Famous last word. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to do that. Uh, it appears that it's going to be the van over there. And you see, like, the issue with that is there's only two front seats and then it's a dark back of a van with no windows. So, um, yeah, famous last words indeed. Let's hope, uh, we get out of this one. <laughs> Let's look around here. There are no windows here. All right. Our driver meant well, but I was pretty sure we were about to die. We then drove in our original broken down van past a sea of garbage from the Morocco border through no man's land towards the Mauritanian border. Maroc finish. You to Sahara. Yeah. To Sahara. The problem? Well, among many problems, the road ended before the border and was replaced by a minefield with exploded vehicles scattered everywhere.
As our driver gripped the wheel of the van, white knuckling all the way, probably wondering why in the hell we wanted to do this, we smiled and took pictures and video. I mean, how often do you get to drive through a suicidal minefield in Africa? The minefield is a relic from a cool-down civil war over Western Sahara. At one point in the minefield, another man started honking at us, causing our driver to suddenly stop. He then backed out and went around the area he was about to drive over. He had nearly run over a landmine. Finally, we came upon the castle-like border of Mauritania where we were in for some questioning and a brutally long wait. Our driver brought the van with all of our belongings in it to the other side of the border. Every moment we sat there wondering if he'd take off with nearly $10,000 worth of gear. But it seemed as though people simply didn't steal in Mauritania. There is a strict honor system. Meanwhile, we sat and got scanned and photographed by border agents. Later, a general before stamping our passports asked us why we were going to Mauritania. We told him to explore. He responded, you sure? It was a welcoming gesture. Well, we're in Mauritania. We were relieved to find out the windowless van couldn't wait any longer and had to go. Close to five hours had gone by at that point. We got in the original van with our original driver who then drove us to Nwadibu. The van wouldn't make it, so the driver desperately waved down every van he saw passing on the highway. Finally, he paid a driver in Nwadibu to let us tag along in the cramped back of a non-air-conditioned van filled with workers on their way to Nwakshat. Many hot, tiring, sand dune filled hours went by, passing towns not listed on any maps as people turned and stared at the crazy white guys walking around Mauritania. <laughs> We have arrived in Nuwakshot. Oh, look, they got food and shit over there. All right. We were greeted by crazy traffic, crazy crowds, and crazy drivers who felt it necessary to drive full speed into oncoming traffic around medians. We survived and arrived at our hotel, Mori Center. <sighs> okay, guys, um, we are at Mori Center Hotel in in Nouakchott, the capital of Mauritania, and it's actually a beautiful room. I will not complain about this at all. It's a beautiful room, it's a beautiful place, and so sad that almost no one in this country can afford to be here. Yeah, seriously, it's probably the nicest hotel in Mauritania. Last night I stayed on in a rugged, disgusting room at the Mauritania border in Morocco. Um, with cockroaches crawling on my face in my sleep and sewage just outside and you know just black mold on the ceiling it was horrible and tonight i'm here and other people are still 
at that place sleeping. And it, you know, I was lucky, I got one of the rooms. Most people were actually sleeping in little rooms that were not closed off at all to the public. Some people were sleeping outside on a sidewalk with the smell of diesel and stray dogs and cats and whatever kind of animals you can think of. So it's, it's sad and you know, it, we traveled all day. It was a four hour drive and it ended up taking almost 12 hours. And I just want to get to the reshot structure. I will take another day or two or three sleeping on the floor. But when, once we got to Maury Center, which um, we were supposed to meet Graham uh, at with the ground penetrating radar, we found out I just got internet finally after all this time. And he says uh, that he just, he took a bus to Atar. <laughs> so we can't get to Atar tonight. We have to go tomorrow. I just really want to bring you guys information from the reshot structure. That's the whole reason I came out here. And it's just been a series of mishap after mishap and government freaking checkpoints everywhere. Everywhere I go, there's a government checkpoint. 15 minutes, another one. 15 minutes, another one. And they keep you sometimes for as much as 20 minutes. Then they don't speak English, which I understand, but then they start yelling at us about, you need this or that, and I don't know what they're saying. It, it's fitting that it might be the birth of civilization, or as we know it anyway, and I want to go to the reshot structure with this ground penetrating radar and find out anything I possibly can before I go. Graham has to leave in a couple days, uh, Micah has to leave in a couple days, Adam is mostly free, but I, I've... It's a four hour drive apparently from Nuadibu to Nuakshot. It's like a V-shaped road in the country. But then it's another, uh, what was it again? Uh, it said like four hours to Atar from uh, Nuakshot. If the other one ended up 12 hours, this one's gonna end up even more because Atar is an even more underdeveloped area. Nuakshot's actually rather developed compared to every place I've seen since I was in about Tangier or so, uh, way up north. I don't know what to do, guys. I don't know what to do, but I'm not leaving here. I'm not giving up before I go to that structure and find out whatever I can. But honestly, it's starting to look like I might end up getting stranded there. And... Anam and Micah have gone upstairs to the restaurant to eat. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna join them there. The camera looks so dark right now. Everything's so dark. Why is it so dark? Mm. And your screen as well? No, he doesn't have a my hair look? All right, so today I am trying to get Aguyas in Nawakshat. And it is increasingly difficult to do literally everything, but um, I'm doing my very best here. Uh, we had some problems. Um, so Graham went to Atar last night, as I mentioned, and um, now I got a message after not having internet for a while again that uh, he has went to um, what's it called? Uh, to Oden. So <laughs> it's just increasingly hard to meet up with everyone here and it's just one thing piling up on top of another because I can't get a hold of him and I can't tell him to stay put. It's just, I don't know man, it's just getting so crazy. But we are determined even if we only have one day at the reshot. So no banks are open apparently. I don't know how things work here. And by the way, the thing to do here is to literally just walk into the road. <laughs> um, but, you know what? Seems to work. It's a uh, little bit of anarchy here. <laughs> just would be nice if the banks were open so I could take money out so I can do things here. Because these drivers that, the drivers that will bring us to um, 
Atar will not take credit card. So, you know, we're kind of screwed right now. Let's see what we can do. It's like we've been, <laughs> we've been doing so good and you're yourself around and nice. Yeah! Off All of right. here. Oh, the wheels are us up. Seriously. Right. <laughs> Parkour! Trying to discover Atlantis and this is what I have to deal with. It's what animals do. Put us in a nice room and just <laughs> f it up. We didn't want to talk about the drapes. Oh. When I did those drapes last night, I don't see nothing wrong. All right, so no, none of the banks are open. Um, coffee time. Coffee? Coffee! An empty plate after a good breakfast before we have very little to no food for the next <laughs> few days. All right. Okay, so I just got a call from uh, Justice, uh, our travel guy, and uh, Atar. And um, so, as I mentioned, uh, Graham went to Auden, and we probably won't be able to get there tonight. I mean, if we get to Atar by 4 p.m., which is very unlikely, um, we'll be able to go. But otherwise, it'll there's no night driving, he says. Sorry, it's so dark in here. And um, so for that reason, we will have to wait till tomorrow. But nonetheless, we will get there. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm kind of impressed, honestly, that um, Graham has gone by himself to Atar, not seeing the country like we have and i mean it's a very safe place but nonetheless it's kind of a scary thing to do by yourself so i'm really impressed uh that he went out there i just really want to document whatever he finds so and i can't get a hold of him the internet isn't working so Wheel them around for me. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. Ugh. I think it's like immediate. Yes, Touch screen, fancy. Mmm, dirty. Dirty. My fancy is my bed. Right. <sighs> Seriously, guys, why can I not get money out of a bank here? Banks are the most outdated thing ever. It's crazy. If everyone just accepted crypto, this would not be a problem. Doesn't close, no problem, easy. There's like 10 banks around here and I can't get into any of them to take out money. Oh, I should just start doing as the Mauritanians do and just walk into traffic. That's what I'm gonna do. So hot. <laughs> we did everything we could to negotiate a good price with locals to drive us to Atar where we'd meet up finally with Graham. Banks weren't open, cash wasn't easy to come by, but locals were incredibly accommodative. If we could do 200 euro or less, then it would be good. No taxman extorting them for helping out tourists. Just nice people who realized the mutually beneficial positions we were both in. All right, so we got a ride for 200 euros. We were able to talk it down a little bit. Um, so we are going to be off to Atar immediately, and Anam has a scarf. He walked in with this, it's, in, it's black, and he walked in with only that and sunglasses. Well, not only that, he wasn't naked, but 
<laughs> but I digress. Uh, we got headscarves so now that we can video. wet. We can wet the uh, scarves and uh, use wear the <laughs> wear the turbans, and it's going to make a huge difference in the desert because it is hot out there, crazy hot. But we are off to Atar, and then Wadan, and then the reshot. So close, so close, but so far away. We'll get there. With encouragement by the late great John Anthony West, a geologist and professor of natural sciences at the College of General Studies, Boston University, by the name of Dr. Robert Schock, went to investigate the Sphinx to debunk the claim that it had water erosion on its body and most notably on its enclosure. What he found shocked the world. He concluded that the Sphinx was far more older than was claimed and due to the water erosion had to have been built between 10,000 BC to 5,000 BC. With further study in the decades that followed, he has since concluded that it could be even older. Thousands of years of rainfall would have caused the bulbous water erosion around the Sphinx. The problem is, there could not have been such rainfall in dynastic times. Interestingly, according to the ancient pyramid texts and especially the inventory stela, the dynastic Egyptians spoke of finding the Sphinx already in place when they ventured to the mounds in which the pyramids were built on top of. The stela in front of the Sphinx is attributed to Khafre, though it can easily be said that the Sphinx was simply renovated by Khafre. After all, there are countless dynastic renovations that are clear to tourists today at the Sphinx. It is quite likely that its head was once much larger and of a different species, but was whittled down from its original. It's considered to represent Khafre, but maintains a closer resemblance to Khufu instead. Pharaohs were famous for claiming far more ancient structures as their own sticking statues of themselves in them to immortalize themselves. The discovery Dr. Robert Schock made at the Sphinx brought to question everything the academics thought they knew about ancient civilizations. The Sphinx dating to the Younger Dryas period? How, how could that be? Oh right, in the 1990s the Younger Dryas period was considered a mythical theory and is now fully proven. Funny how that happens. Nonetheless, for the past 200 years, mostly incontrovertibly repeated, ancient civilizations were thought to have sprung up around 3000 BC, around the time of Stonehenge and the Pyramid at Saqqara. Then came the disruptive news of the finding of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey's Urfa province. Gobekli Tepe has been dated to around 9130 BC at the lowest level so far excavated. It's a massive site also known as Potbelly Hill filled with countless pillars built, buried and then built on top of again. The ancients repeatedly buried the site themselves. What's even crazier is it is still just barely excavated and the majority is still underground. Imagine the dating on what is underneath the third layer, which is considered the oldest. The T-shaped pillars are phenomenal and include 3D images on the rock, which is substantially more impressive than engravings. One pillar also appears to show a bird creature holding a ball or the world like King Atlas held the sphere. Another image on the same pillar shows a famous bag that we see throughout the world in so-called Egyptian dynastic times, Sumerian, Babylonian, and yes, Inca, Aztec, and Mayan times. How does that happen? Could that be the helping hand of passed on knowledge we spoke of earlier? According to academics, forced, by the way, to accept the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, Primitive hunter-gatherers who could not yet even farm threw down their spears, stopped eating bugs, and built a phenomenal stone structure, burying it over and over again. Felt as though that was enough 
picked up their spears again for 7,000 years and then threw them down again to build the most magnificent structures that have ever existed that are next to impossible for modern humans to recreate. Imagine that logic. Well, that's what the majority of people believe or at least identify with. So the Sphinx geologically must be around 12,000 years old. Gobekli Tepe existed over 11,000 years ago. The Great Flood apparently happened around the same time period, uh, according to Noah, Gilgamesh, the Incas, Aztecs, Mayans, and Olmecs, as well as the Egyptians. Osiris apparently lived in this era. Science has proven a massive asteroid strike as well as evidence of a plasma burst in this era. There was a mass extinction of 75% of North American mammals around this time and Atlantis was supposed to have been destroyed at this time as well. And that's a coincidence. The oldest sites around the Great Pyramids and around Egypt tend to be attributed to Osiris. The House of Osiris, now called the Temple of Khafre because a small statue of Khafre built out of a different material was found inside, is a great example. Water erosion on the outside walls completely ignored by academics. Completely different building methods. Then in the same building method is the Osirion, which we recently did a video breakdown on, far below the surface of the nearby Seti temple, filled with water. Since we're talking about aging, look at Machu Picchu. According to academics, the site was built completely at the same time. Meanwhile, the architecture is completely different. There are incredible stones fit together like puzzle pieces with evidence of vast earthquake damage. While essentially rubble is piled on top and not a single stone was toppled by such a large earthquake? We're supposed to believe that? The perfect drill and saw cuts in places like Tiwanaku and Pumapunku? The countless failed attempts made by modern man to recreate the saw tactics of the past? And what about the lack of tools in both places in the East and the West? Where are the billions upon billions of tools that would have been needed to build these structures like the Great Pyramids? To bring this back to Atlantis, the ancient city was said to be a great military power and had advanced technologies. Around its concentric rings, it had a great cityscape, a ring of military and royalty in the Middle Island, with a seafaring port and trade connections with the outside world. It can be imagined how information and culture spread like we see today. Could humanity be of a cyclical nature? Rising and falling throughout history, forgotten with decay and cataclysm. Were the Egyptian, Mayan, Incan, Olmec, and Babylonian gods just people with advanced knowledge? Looked upon as gods by the less talented and educated? Could they have just been the messengers, deified as myth for eternity? <laughs> From up here. Don't put your sunglasses on. Something like that, hang down. I'll figure it out though. Yeah, now no try the sunglasses. Yeah? Yeah, you definitely look like uh, some guys from a recruitment video I saw once. <laughs> And on we went through more dunes and more unmapped rural communities.
Here we begun seeing the mountains in the first level of the plateau. You could see the evidence of erosion from both wind and water. We are 170 kilometers from Atar. We're gonna make it, guys. I think so. That's what you did, really? <laughs> Some wall? There was a series of flat land followed by mountainous land, followed by flat land and repeat. The terrain was quickly changing. It was impossible to miss. As the sun went down, we drove around cliffs down mountain roads until we suddenly entered a tar. So we arrived last night in this absolutely beautiful place in Atar. <clears throat> you know, there's something about Google Images that kind of makes me wonder because Google Images shows Atar as not the nicest place. And then you come here and it's beautiful and we're at Bab Sahara, uh, bed and breakfast. And there's just, it's such an incredible place. <laughs> it's amazing. So, yeah, don't believe Google Images when it comes to these towns. Obviously, this is stands out a bit from the town, but the town is quite nice as well. Um, and it's nestled in these hills. And again, just amazingly welcoming, nice people. So we are heading to the reshot structure today. We're finally, finally doing it. Looking forward to it. Whatever they told you about Mauritanian food it was mostly wrong. I have actually been kind of enjoying the food here, and it's a beautiful place to eat it. The town of Atar was actually quite nice. Everyone appeared to have the same car. The streets were crowded with merchants, but there was no time to explore. We were off to the reshot in a rush. Well, gentlemen, we are on the way to the reshot structure. It's okay. been a long, long, long journey. Unbelievable. It's, uh, but you know, every moment of it, I'm, I'm grateful for, and it's just been, hard but it's been incredible and i can't wait to finally set foot in guelb Arashat, and we're so so close time to do what we should have done long ago and get photocopies of our passports for the checkpoints i don't know why we didn't think of that before We now only had 
the one day to see it, and we were running out of time fast. The roads essentially end at Atar, so from there on we were driving through sand and gravel. The rapidly changing desert terrain was constantly apparent as we studied the mountains surrounding us. Exactly as Plato said, actually. Red, black, and white stone in the area. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, volcanic. It was hard to tell apart the decay and the water erosion. We simply recommend geologists study the 4K imagery we are bringing you. Telling apart 10 million year old and 12,000 year old erosion is not my forte. We were on top of the highest plateau leading to Wadan, but it was still a four hour drive. As you can see, we are now in a plateau between Atar and Chinggedi. And it is quite beautiful. And if you look, there is volcanic rock everywhere. Everywhere you look. This is a truly incredible place. Just to walk into the Sahara Desert drive into some mountains and the terrain changes entirely. Um, Justice, our travel guide in Atar, told us that this whole area here is on a plateau. So there's three layers. There's one coming close to Atar, um, a second layer where Atar is, and a third layer after Atar. And we are currently, I believe, on the third layer close to Goelb Arishat. We are getting close, my friends. Passed by new and old ruins, it was clear that people had been in this region for a long time. Why? It's impossible to say. You cannot find a more rugged environment anywhere else in the world. The story of Atlantis refers to Egypt as somewhat of a colony of Atlantis. A colony that survived the Great Flood. The pyramids have forever boggled the minds of the masses. Academics too often act as though they can explain the pyramids as simple tombs. This is despite finding nearly no mummies in any pyramids ever, give or take a few decrepit later dynastic pyramids as well as one at Saqqara. The great pyramids were built near perfectly with mathematical precision built on energetic ley lines with vast knowledge of the stars. Robert Baval matched the pyramids to Orion's belt decades ago and was shunned because of it. Despite this obvious claim being proven true many years later, the pyramids perfectly match up with Orion's belt and their chambers and shafts match with Orion and Sirius as well. Orion's belt is said to be the home of Osiris. The Great Sphinx was also built to perfectly face due east. The chambers within the Great Pyramids are mathematically in tune with frequency. In fact, it was recently acknowledged by scientists that the pyramids themselves can concentrate electromagnetic frequency. So they can technically conduct energy. 
They're built on top of underground water passages. There are pipes all over the Giza Plateau as well as shafts. The Nile once ran alongside the pyramids. If you utilize granite and limestone and concentrate the energy source to the top with a gold capstone as a shaft goes underground to the water source, you can produce a high volume of electricity. So could the pyramids have been a power plant? They do appear from within to be built as a functional machine. Chambers built to mathematical pi and phi. Phi being 1 plus 1 equals 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, etc. It's also a perfect echo chamber and experiments have been done proving it to be highly conductive within. With random tunnels within the pyramids and massive stones that one cannot possibly imagine lifting millions of, the pyramids are simply incredible. It cannot be said enough. Interestingly, the Nile had countless pyramids placed alongside it, all in view of each other in the distance. Studies have also been done to understand the construction of the pyramids, which debunk the most exemplified and touted methods. The ramps up the side of the pyramid to lift stones in the slave theory would have to have been built to nearly the same extent as the pyramid itself, meaning there would have had to have been a ramp stretching nearly a mile. The construction feat of the ramp alone would have been enormous. Could elephants have been used? Well, considering the region, no. <laughs> but assuming they were, thousands of elephants would have had to have been tied together to have pulled many of the stones. First of all, once at the top of this ridiculously sized ramp, where would they have gone? Sounds pretty crowded. Also, good luck tying 20 elephants together, never mind over a thousand. The pyramids also did not have hieroglyphs meant to carry the dynastic dead to the afterlife. This was a very important part of death rituals among the dynastics, yet academics constantly pass this fact off as anomalous in the case of the pyramids. So they built this massive structure with unbelievable sustainability only to not bother painting the walls? Right. It should also be mentioned that construction got more and more primitive with each pyramid that followed the Great Pyramids. Most are reduced to rubble today and are unrecognizable. And to top this all off, apparently the knowledge of all of these great structures were passed down from the Atlanteans to the Egyptians, according to legends. Interesting, isn't it? All of these ancient places throughout the world who talk about godly technology, who have the same connections to astrology, who all have the same great flood stories, who all have gods that date back to the time of the younger Dryas, they all seem interconnected. But Atlantis is a myth that by coincidence happens to connect perfectly to this ancient wisdom. Mali, next to Mauritania, is home to the Dogon people who have the most similar cultural beliefs and language to the ancient Egyptians. Many believe that the Egyptians found refuge in Mali, but could the Dogons have been the remnants of Atlanteans who eventually made their way to Egypt, leaving some people behind? The Mauritanians have a superstition about eyes. In places like ancient Chinggeti in Mauritania, we found drawings of eyes everywhere. Locals would not give us any comprehensive answer when we asked them about it. Uh, this? Uh, everywhere? Uh-huh. Ah. They have a superstition about the so-called evil eye and so it's imperative among many in the country to look at one another with kind eyes. It's an interesting concept. No one knows how far back this superstition goes. But it just happens to be in a place with a giant eye in the middle of the desert. 
an eye they could not have known was an eye from the ground, an eye that is reminiscent of Horus, son of Osiris, the same Horus who also brought about a cataclysm as revenge for his father's death. Interesting, isn't it? So now here we are traveling across ancient Mauritania to find Atlantis in the desert. We were told it was a red zone, but people are doing everything they can to help us in our journey. Regardless of how hard it was getting to the reshot, we were finally achieving our mission. We are coming so close. What do you think about the ride so far, Adam? Yeah, it's good. Feels good to know that we're almost to our mission. Yeah. About a half hour away, it looks like. Half to, uh, hour? Wadain. Yeah, almost at uh, Wadain. <laughs> Wadain? <laughs> I don't know. I'll never get the pronunciations correct, but I'll try. Um, we are very close. I can't imagine getting stranded out here. It is so incredibly desolate. A couple camels and lizards here and there and that's about it. But really interesting stone. In the true Wadan style, buildings were built out of rubble. When they collapsed, all that was left was a pile of rocks, uncut but simply naturally formed rocks in a pile. We entered Wadan, one of the most incredible towns I've ever visited, but only for a moment. We will return <laughs> later to sleep, but our main mission right now is get to the reshot as fast as we can. just past Wadan and you can see the tear duct of the Eye of the Sahara right behind me and we are so 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 close we stopped for a moment here and it, you notice it almost instantly just turns to sand below you very fine sand I truly cannot tell you how incredible it is to be entering this structure. See a stone standing here, naturally formed but obviously placed by a human. <laughs> Not saying that anyone in Atlantean times placed it, but uh, definitely this area is a historic, historic area that people have been living in as long as humans have been around as far as we know. And this was all once a vast jungle. You can see a bit of an oasis behind me here, but it's mostly just unforgiving desert. And we are going to now enter the structure. The sand was almost a blank mat of color, with trees, donkeys, and goats along the way. I think we are. <laughs> Look at that, guys. Climbing over dunes here. It's absolutely beautiful and we can see the reshot. It's massive. And I think we are it's about time we enter.
It was impossible to miss the first ridge of the reshot in the distance. Our driver drove over dangerous dunes that seemingly ended out of nowhere. And there it was. We were finally there. I would have thought at first glance that it would just look like a hill from the ground. But it wasn't your average ridge. You could see the rings arch from the ground. Someone had tipped off local women that we were going to the reshot structure, so they laid out arts and crafts to sell us, but we were on a mission, we had no time to stop, we were full speed ahead. Here we see the entrance to the structure from the outside. Clearly the rings were not that large in height. We were now inside the structure and entering into the first low point. There is the second ring. As you can see, this over here is the first opening of the first circle. And uh, here you see the second ring. It's hard to tell from the ground, but it's quite incredible to be here. We are in the low point here and just look at the ground littered with, with stone. It's truly incredible after all of this journey to be here right now. I don't even know how to put it into words. Look at this. Look at that. Look at this shale. It crumbles. Layers of rock. What do you think of this place, Adam? Adam Chanter here, standing in between the first and second rings of the reshot structure. Pretty impressed by it. It's grand, it's grandiose. This is big across as Las Vegas, Nevada. 25 miles across, is that right, Josh? That's right. I gotta say, it's, it is a place that you could imagine being full of water halfway and having people living on the tops of all of the uh, high spots in concentric rings having water access in between the rings. It would be like a full-on civilization. I'm pretty impressed by it. It's hard to tell exactly what has happened here thousands of years ago, but really, anything's possible. We were then headed to the second ring. There were long lines of stone on the ground. It was impossible to say if they were placed by man or naturally strewn about. We were following the tire tracks towards Graham. Here we were entering the second ring. 
It was next to impossible to tell from the ground. There were no even lines. We did see a lot of loose stone walls placed by nomads in the area. We are on top of the second ring here and you could see the center in the distance. It's it's hard to it's hard to believe. We got a stack of rocks here. We will be proceeding down the uh, rocks here and in between the second ring and the center. We'll be going up into the center and I think that's where we will be meeting our friend Graham at <laughs> long last. On the second ring. Look at this. Wow. It's incredibly smooth. Hate to break it, but This is how smooth it is. <laughs> Brittle. You can see this erosion on it. It's incredible. Oh, that white patch. That, that is one of the things that I wanted to check out. The white patch could be salt. perfect flatness between the second ring and the center was truly astonishing. It was like nothing we had yet seen in Mauritania. Here we go guys. It was hard to tell when we were entering the center. Parts of the center were at the same low points as the secondary low point between the second ring and the center. It was hard to distinguish between the two other than some hills. But there we were. Not only is a footage dizzying, but it was also quite dizzying going over such huge bumps for hours on end. Here you see more stacked stone. This was incredibly common within the structure and I believe that it had something to do with nomads trying to make sure that they knew where to go if they got lost. From the 
sky it looks very blue. You can see the rocks that make it look blue. Kind of look blue to the eye on the ground too. Center. Long journey. I bet, yeah. So how's uh, how have you been enjoying the race structure? Been doing well, yeah. Um, can we pause the video for one second? Yeah, actually. It was at this point that Graham told us that he was unwilling to use his ground penetrating radar as he was told by his guide that it was strictly prohibited. So at this point, essentially all of our potential scientific research flew out the window. It was a crushing moment. We had just risked our life going a very long way to get there. And then we find out that there's licenses and permits and that the government was afraid that we might steal gold from the ground and run off with it somehow. It was infuriating. But Graham made the decision that he should not use a ground penetrating radar and I respect his decision. We were just at this point scrambling to find ways to get information but we were also told that we were running out of time and we had essentially no time left at the structure. So we did literally whatever we could. We wandered around the structure uphill, downhill, assessing the rocks and got whatever information we could possibly compile. Little bits of trash and plastic and stuff around. But um, yeah, I mean, definitely like my sense on the ground is that it's like completely natural, but yeah. it looks like it's been this way for 10,000 years, but that's exactly what you'd expect of course. if a flood washed over the entire structure. Mm. Yeah, there's just tons of volcanic combinations of rock everywhere. Pretty cool stuff. It used to be a structure. That's one of the interesting things about their architectural skills out here about 800 years ago, yeah. they just stack stones. And then uh -huh. all that you have left is just, you know, the remnants of those stones. They're in piles and, you know, circles and stuff. But you could see um, the blue stone in person and it's really incredible. You, it's kind of got that blue tinge to mm -hmm. it that you see from the sky. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating place honest and you can see how I mean if this was an ancient metropolis an ancient city it would have been the most badass city in the ancient world yeah sure. I mean totally the scale and the scope of it and the way you can see in all directions 360 degrees and like whether or not it's the perfect circle from space like when you're on the ground it absolutely looks like a completely totally perfect circle absolutely as if turned with a lathe Oh, what? We have finally arrived at the center of Guelb Erishat, the reshot structure. And as you can see here, we do have some probably 800 year old stonework somewhere around that time period. It's not, uh, it's not, you know, really unique, but it's interesting to come out here. People have been living here for as long as humans have been around. Um, at the time of this being a jungle, um, to this day there's still Berbers that wander these areas with their sheep and build structures similar to what we see right here. The circular structure. This looks like it used to be a well of some sort. We see a hole in the center. Um, unfortunately there are lots of problems here with um, garbage. So that is an issue indeed. Um, I have a habit of not sticking my hands down holes in the desert, but you can kind of see this is quite interesting indeed. Now one question is, do I believe that this 
was all man-made? And the simple answer is absolutely not. This itself, the concentric rings that we see here, they are most certainly naturally made. However, the question is what could people have built on top of this structure? We have to look at things like the pyramids, for example, where we see these massive megalithic structures built on already existing mounds. And it would make sense for people to build here in a time where there's water and foliage and an ability to eat and drink and live in, in peace. But uh, obviously in the many thousands of years since the Sahara has become a desert, it's absolutely incredibly difficult. So is it man-made? This area, no, you can clearly see that on the ground that it is not. There's bedrock everywhere and it's just too overly eroded. If it was man-made maybe five million years ago, not in recent times, but it is an incredible sight to behold. And we're going to see what we can see here. We have a few coordinates that we do want to get to and figure out as much as we can about this unique place that you've, you can't find anywhere in the known universe. And at that point, we found out that we couldn't go to any of the coordinates because, for one, the GPS wasn't picking up a signal, and secondly, we didn't have time. We have lots of luck, just not good luck. It feels like... There's no sign of like habitation or civilization whatsoever, aside from these like obviously recent structures. So there's a lot to be said here, Graham. Um, you know, one of the things I noticed was when you look from the sky at this incredible site, it just doesn't give you in any way a scale of what this place is really like on the ground. That's true. You look around here and you see it's incredibly hilly and bumpy and I just have a hard time, you know, seeing it as a center island. Um, you were mentioning uh, a short while ago here that it looks like water would have flown through here. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on this area here? Yeah, I mean, certainly standing in the center, it feels like we're more in a basin than on some sort of like, we're not on a level plain at all in mm -hmm. the center. In fact, you can see these hills rising around us. And if, if the center was all one level plain, I think that would add credence to the theory. But the fact that if water had filled the structure, we could be underwater standing at the center um, unless they were controlling their water in some way through canals and drainage and had uh, routed the water away from the center, then I could see that possibly existing. Uh, certainly, you couldn't build temples on top of the bedrock outcroppings. I mean, I suppose yeah. you could, but you wouldn't want to. Yeah, let's look at that for a second here. I mean, this is incredibly, obviously, volcanic. I mean, look at the black rock. Absolutely and you see it everywhere littering the ground and you could smell it you could smell the smell of it basically if if i were to um give it uh, another example it would be like asphalt like the smell of hot asphalt being poured it's a very very kind of metallic uh <laughs> dirty <laughs> i don't know if that's the right word for it but kind of a dirty smell um and you could see mag uh, magmatic uh, rock everywhere i mean Look at some of this stone here. Sharp, jagged, clearly binded and had been melted at one point. Um, you see a lot of objects that are man-made, uh, stones that are carved, but they're primitive and uh, clearly even from probably the last century. Um, but there's no doubt people have been here for probably as long as humanity has been around. And this was once jungle area, jungle terrain. But with that said, I mean, guys, I wanted to be Atlantis. I think all of us wanted to be Atlantis, but if it's not Atlantis, we need to keep looking. And I'm telling you, being on the ground, where are the mountains to the north? 
I do not see mountains to the north. I see all the hills in the center. And I mean, the, the center is just one hill after another and these little mounds. Now, I mean, has anything megalithic been here before? Possibly, I just don't see it. And it's, you know, we'd have to do incredible research of the whole structure, which we certainly don't have time for. And, uh, you know, regulations and all that kind of stuff in play, we'd have to get a lot of licenses and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the same old fun stuff. But it just seems like- And it would be looking, it'd be like looking for a needle in a haystack. Oh, totally. I mean, where would you, where would you hope to find? You'd have to get lucky and stumble on the right thing. And then yeah. you wouldn't even know what you were looking at unless you were able to excavate. Yeah, exactly. Let's uh, climb this little hill up here and see what it looks like from up here. I know you've been here for a couple days already. Yeah. And uh, you got here. Uh, it was funny because <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, my plane's going to be late from Casablanca. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm like, OK, we should meet up around the same time. And uh -huh. then we missed the border crossing. Yep. And then the Nouakchott drive from Nouadhibou ended up taking like drive eight hours. Yep. So uh, it, it said four hours on Google Earth, not, uh, not so like much. Seven. Yeah, it was, yep. uh, it was long, that was a long but drive. you know what? I'm telling you guys, regardless of what it is, we came here not to prove our own point, but to study and find answers. And one answer that I have already, which while I'm not exactly precisely sure what this is, I would say that there is a lot more research to be done and I encourage everyone to come out here and to explore this. Mauritania is safe. The people are some of the nicest people I've ever met. They will give you the shirt off their back even if they don't have a shirt. It's, uh, it's a beautiful country full of beautiful people willing to do anything to help you out because they have pride in living here and I can see why. It's a beautiful landscape, also very unforgiving, so be prepared for that, but yeah. it's a beautiful landscape and I'm very, very happy I came here. Um, so we got a lot of uh, large stones up here. You could just tell from looking at this that could it be a class volcano? It would be the only one that we've ever seen that looks like this. But anomalies are known to exist. Now, did people build on top of it? I think it's a possibility. We just gotta find something. <laughs> All right. We're at this peak anyway. Oh. This is uh, quite incredible though. I mean, I, have you ever been to a place like this? No, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life, to be honest. I mean, Atlantis or not, it is just stunningly beautiful and vast. It's just incredible. Mm. I've noticed that a lot of the lines that you see on the map are tire tracks. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> um, you could see them from up here. And obviously, one thing I do want to try and find is that well, that freshwater well. Mm -hmm somewhere on here but i mean look at this structure it's massive i mean from the sky it looks like one island uh in the middle like look at this like does that look like one island to you it's a bunch of hills i can't even tell the difference it's a valley with multiple hills it's just when you pull it all together and the coloring of the structure as well when you look at it from space it looks like perfect concentric circles i can say 100% right here and right now at the reshot structure, they are not perfectly concentric circles. Um, when you get on the ground and you get to a more microscopic level, I guess you could say, it's clear that um, there's a, I mean, it's a unique structure, but it's very hilly and in no way concentric. But nonetheless, I wouldn't uh, give anything to miss the chance to come out to a place like this. I'm definitely bringing home a rock from this structure. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can't leave here without a rock. Come on guys, look at that view. You cannot beat this incredible sight before. 
absolutely incredible. Yeah, people are going to be pretty unhappy with uh, the results here and very disappointed. But guys, I'm telling you, we must find the truth. You know, our motto here is find the truth, be the change. We need to be the change and for that to happen, we must be educated and with that education, we will uh, change the world. But with that said, if, if we find a place that isn't what we want it to be, we should not try and fit a cube into a triangle shape. We need to keep looking. Confirmation bias is what ruins things for everyone. That's what ruins things for the academics. They want to confirm their viewpoint at whatever cost, even if it ruins their career or makes them look stupid. Look at Zahi Hawass. Look at a lot of these academics in the field of archaeology and Egyptology that have completely ignored obvious, obvious evidence of a much older civilization that was wiped out. And now all this evidence is coming out, the Greenland Crater, all, this, all these plasma bursts, the Ice Age, Younger Dryas period, etc. And they, can, they, they still stay firm on their view that everything they've said for 150 years is true. Do we want to be like them? Or do we want to set our own path and find the truth instead of looking to prove ourselves right? And it's such a vast wasteland it would be Im absolutely impossible to properly see what's underground everywhere at the site and to properly measure what could have been here at one point but I mean look at it better yet come to the site I'm very grateful for coming out here for all of you who have watched and listened for all of you with interest in truly breaking down the realities of history that we have not been told and there's many and we have been lied to we have been misled and in many cases people are just stubborn and they want to prove their bias and once again that should not be us that should not be our direction they said Troy was mythical until they found it. Oh, Homer just made it up. Troy doesn't exist. And of course they found Troy. They say Atlantis was a myth. I think one day we'll find the remnants. We just have to stay strong. We have to keep looking. And I think that the theories that have come out about this place are absolutely incredible. I think that people have done an excellent job exposing this site to potentially be Atlantis. We then took part in a sacred tea ceremony in the center of the reshot. My camera was not liking me and was doing everything it could to stay alive in the crazy heat of the Sahara. Oh, really good. Mashallah, mashallah. Obviously, this looks to be the most incredibly uniform candidate for the site of Plato's Atlantis or Solon's Atlantis or Herodotus's Atlantis, whoever came up with it first, if anyone. This seems to be the place. But is it really you can say a lot of things from the sky you can say a lot of things by looking on the internet and seeing things that seem to be uniform and seem to come together really well but going to the scene itself on foot tends to sometimes change a situation we are in the middle of the reshot structure right now and i can't help but notice these hills everywhere around us and these lower points as you see below there which tend to paint a different picture than what you see from the sky especially considering the elevations down there match with some of the elevations over there and we're already in the center and so is that and that would mean that the center island would be multiple different islands um it doesn't seem to be as uniform as it appeared from the sky with uh plato's um description from sice of Atlantis. I wanted to ask what is your reaction 
to the reshot structure here now that we are in the center of the reshot structure? Um, I think that if I had a million people and vast riches, this would be a great place to build a civilization. I don't see any evidence of a 12,000 or a 5,000 year old civilization here really at all. But I also don't know how far things would degrade in that amount of time. So would, could there have been certain structures here before or even a vast civilization? I am not educated on the topic well enough to even start to theorize, but I know that the land formation itself is incredible and it's amazing to be here. It feels like a special place, yeah. like in an intuitive way. I'm picking up that it's, um, it's a special place on this planet. And if this, uh, the Rishot structure was on Mars and we were looking at it through the lens of a telescope, it would be something of great interest to us. Um, that we would want to explore once we got to that planet. So I'm happy to be here on this planet with all of you humans uh, to, to, to see this uh, amazing structure, yeah. Uh, there's a lot to be said about uh, how the government restricts ground penetrating radar and stuff out here so people cannot look without massive licenses and paying huge amounts of money um, so that should be pointed out uh, the it, it always seems that no matter where you go in the world the number one thing that stands in your way tends to be the government but um, <laughs> but with that said uh, what what stands out about this site uh, to you um, after we went through all the rings and we're in the center of this massive structure today uh for me man it's just uh looking at the gps as we were riding in the in the vehicle out here and just every spot was exactly the way it was you know maybe that's a silly thing to notice but for me it's like is it really the same way and just i was curious as to whether or not once we get out here if we could see that the hills you know since it's a pretty big structure yeah. see that it actually circles around and from what I can see, it definitely looks like it does, and it's a spectacular place. It's it brings up so many questions, even beyond uh, Atlantis. You know, why? What, what is it? Why is it here? If it is, if Atlantis was here and didn't build it, uh, for example, then how? Why is it created this way? Mm -hmm. Or if Atlantis never was here again, why was it created this way? Like how? How did this happen? People say a volcano, but uh, maybe that. But still, uh, it's it's a pretty spectacular thing for a volcano to make. Yeah. Um, it seems a little perfect, you know what I mean? Especially from, from above, it's, it's exactly an eye with an eyebrow even, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. So, uh, you can only imagine if, uh, it's looking at it from the sky, if anyone was able to do it long ago, it would have been a pretty sacred sight to behold. <laughs> with time running out, we bid Graham adieu uh, and spend some time driving around the structure. Before we headed back, there is one more thing I needed to do. This is all very salty looking. That's salt. That's salt. You, you could see this area from the sky. That's hot. It's 
So evidence shows there was definitely salt water here before between the rings. Absolutely no doubt about it. It is cut and dry salt, but uh, what that leads us to believe, I don't know. It could have been millions of years ago that there was salt water here. It could have been thousands of years ago. I don't know, but uh, one thing is certainly clear. Um, we do have a spot that salt water used to run through this land and uh, I don't know what that tells us, but it's pretty interesting to say the least. He's yelling about this fungus. He got his ear right here. And of course we couldn't head back to Wadan yet without giving some attention to the local merchants. Here you could see the mountains to the north. We then headed to the closest town, Wadan, to explore the ancient ruins as the sun went down. Oh, you can imagine how big this place was, it's almost completely abandoned now. Our time was up at the reshot. Beautiful sunset. The next day we went to Chinggeti nearby over hours of sand dunes. Well, I found some camels. Hey buddy. <laughs> We attempted to view the nearby petroglyphs. The petroglyphs show giraffes and elephants, animals that have not existed in the area since the Sahara was a jungle terrain. The government had closed the area to tourists due to renovations. We were unable to see the petroglyphs. More disappointments, but it was hard not to think about how lucky we truly were to be out in this beautiful, remote place. I'm going to see what's inside. So I wandered nearby around black rock cliffs and caves next to a beautiful valley. The edge of that cliff over there. Interesting. I got stung by a strange white wasp and found tool marks around the stones but nothing that I considered significant. Seriously guys, this bug will not leave me alone. Oh my God. It's like some white looking hornet thing. It keeps trying to go in my ear and my mouth and on my hand. Now look at that. Ah, get lost. Ampshanta, Mortania. Bezzy the free Mortania. Standing in the reshot structure, I felt as though it was natural, but I, I was consumed by a great landmass that could not be understood from the ground. 
Our travel agent told us about a place in the structure with a Roman-like road that locals were aware of. We could not get to it. There was so much we couldn't do. We were all aware going into it that the government might not want us using ground-penetrating radar, but we thought we might get away with it anyways as, you know, we were helping them with tourism at the very least. We weren't about to mine and run away with their gold, copper, and iron. We just wanted to solve an ancient mystery. With a torturous travel experience and wandering under the blasting hot sun of the Sahara Desert in Mauritania, our morale was dying fast. We were not allowed to do so much of what we wanted to do. I respected Graham's decision to not use the radar. I understand the fear of being in a foreign country and possibly breaking their laws. I was just seriously disappointed, not, not just for myself, but for our viewers. I risked my life going to the other side of the world to investigate this site and leaving with so little, it truly hurt me. I wasn't sure if it was Atlantis. Finding seashells in the sand that were not fossilized told me that water was there more recently than recorded history tells us. The tantalizing notion of Roman roads in the area piqued my interest. Romans didn't get that far. But again, we couldn't go to these sites. We had a matter of hours after all of the travel we had done. I could not see the mountains to the north, which in a way debunked the idea in my head. The mountains to the north were hardly larger than the ridges within the structure and standing at the highest point in the structure I still couldn't see these mountains. I think that's a debunking factor. However, I did find salt in the structure around the ridges and I saw the fresh water well in the center, but it was filled with litter, plastic bottles of urine from tourists who cared not about the sustainability of what could be a vastly ancient site. There were camel bones throughout the structure, bedrock jutting out of the sand, which told me that there wasn't much under the sand. Despite this, I, I would have liked to look, but even if we could have looked 250 feet below the sand, if a great cataclysm hit the site with the force of the entire ocean, everything would have been destroyed. It was clearly a volcanic area. The area smelled of asphalt. It was, it was a strong tar smell that filled the air. There were countless nomad shacks and straw huts built. Wandering around the structure, despite finding almost nothing, it was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. It could have been Atlantis. The longer it's been since I was standing there, the more I realized I may have been too quick to judge at the site. I wasn't opening my mind enough while there. I just wanted to get work done. I went from being 100% sure it was Atlantis to being there and being only 25% sure. And now I'm back up to 50%. But the problem is I have to go back now. And I will. No matter how much the trip bankrupted me, no matter the effort that had to be made and how hard and painful it was getting to the site, no matter the language or culture barrier, no matter the disappointments that came with being unable to do the studies I wanted, I want to go back. The people of Mauritania are truly brilliant. Multiple languages and a culture of honor that I felt from every single Mauritanian I met. I will go back with a longer schedule and hopefully a few more dollars or aguyas in my pocket and I will examine the land more. I will go to the coordinates I so badly wanted to go to but couldn't. I will document whatever the hell the landmass is if it's Atlantis or not. There's a good chance it's not but it deserves analysis one way or another. Meanwhile, we should continue to search for Atlantis outside of the reshot structure. We shouldn't get hung up on one place. There are so many theories from the coast of Cuba to Santorini, Greece, from near Peru to even near the famous Atlantis Bahamas Resort. None of them entirely fit the Plato account, but 
neither does the reshot entirely. It's, it's just a really close fit. My journey in life is the truth. I'm dedicated to the truth, whatever the truth may be. The truth doesn't have an opinion. The history of an intelligent species that miraculously exists in the middle of a vast galaxy with a forgotten cyclical history should be studied religiously. Lost empires and great trials and tribulations. We've been around for hundreds of thousands of years, but we only seem to remember the past 5,000. This deserves greater research. From this research, we may also learn of ways to avoid the past cataclysms that have reverted our species to the Stone Age on possibly multiple occasions. I believe this to be vastly important. In the next year, I will be visiting some of the most astonishing sites throughout the world. I will be going throughout Turkey to visit ancient sites and study them. I plan on traveling through Iraq and Iran as well. There is much of Central and South America I wish to explore. Africa also continues to present so many incredible histories not yet saved for the future history books. Stick around for my travels and reports on ancient civilizations. There are many to come. I, I hope you can help support me on these journeys. I really cannot do any of this at all without you. For those interested, here is my Bitcoin address and linked below are countless ways you can help keep me and my media alive. You are the change you wish to see and your help is crucial to allowing us to bring you this content for free. Meanwhile, I'll leave you with this. Fear is healthy. It stops you from walking into traffic. It's a basic part of survival. Fear keeps you alive, but it also stops you from living. You must balance your fear and moderate what shadows hold you back. A meteor can cast a large shadow, but so can a mouse. The fear of traveling to great places stops us from learning about these great places. Most sites around the world are far safer than people claim. People are mostly the same everywhere. They want to make money to live off of and they want to go to sleep at night. The vast majority of people don't want to behead you or kidnap you. They want to provide for you and benefit personally as well from what they provide you. It's the marketplace. As far as that goes, New York and Nouakchott, Mauritania are no different. You should always be very vigilant wherever you go and be smart. But don't allow hypothetical boogeymen to stand in your way. I risked my life on this trip and while I wasn't able to bring you all exactly what you wanted, it was an experience I will never forget and I certainly will never regret. Neither will you.